Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, today's topic is Budget Development for Grants, an introduction. And our speaker today is Dr. Yoko Bra, uh, the uh, PhD Program Director for Creative Arts Therapies. Let me throw it over to you, uh, Dr. Bra, and take it away. Thank you so much. All right, so today is um, really going to be focused on introducing you all to just very, very basic um, terms uh, that are important to develop uh, the development of a budget. So these will be terminology that you frequently hear or, or that you will be expected to just know somehow um, without um, these things per se being explained to you. And the reason why they might often not be explained to you is that for people who deal with budgets all the time or for researchers who deal with budgets all the time, um, um, I realized myself that I, I forget that these things may have never been explained uh, to new scholars. And it was actually in my mixed methods research class um, this past spring that some students said when I asked them at the end, what are some other things that you would like to learn? And some students said, just like some basic concepts of, of budget, like what is a direct cost? What are, what are indirect costs? And I thought that was a great idea. So I brought that to, to Darren's attention and here we are. So I'm going to present um, these concepts, but, and since we're a very small group, unless the, I know more people have registered this, so unless the group uh, grows tremendously, but as long as we're so a small group, please feel free to jump in. I don't have all of you up on my screen, so just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. You don't have to uh, raise your hands. Uh, because it just might be easier if you have, if something is confusing or if you have a clarifying question to ask it right uh, in the moment. And then at the end of the presentation, we should definitely have plenty of time to uh, talk about any additional concepts uh, that you uh, may have questions about. Okay. All right. So the first um, uh, thing to know, just to, to put some of the things that I will be talking about in context that when you develop a budget, um, costs that are typically included or uh, budget lines that are typically included are, of course, salary and wages and the associated fringe benefits, uh, purchase services, and I'll talk more about that, supplies and materials, equipment, and I'll talk about the difference between supplies and equipment, travel, participant cost, advertisement and recruitment materials, publication cost, consultants and subawards, yeah? That is true for most projects, uh, although in basic science, there may be other things that might fall uh, outside of, uh, uh, of this, but I think these are kind of the large uh, categories that will typically be included in your budget. And I just wanted, even though we're not talking really about budget development yet uh, today, that will be for another uh, seminar, I just wanted you to have an idea of these things as I will be mentioning some of these items in uh, some future slides. So the first uh, really important thing to, re uh, difference to realize is the, or to understand, sorry, is the difference between direct cost and indirect. Right, you probably have all heard of indirect cost, it's also called the FNA rate or facilities and administration uh, rate. The direct cost refers to all the direct cost without any exclusion. So, basically, anything that you add in your grant, yeah, without any exclusion. However, in most um, grant uh, budgets, you will need to make a difference between your total direct cost and your mod modified total direct cost. The reason, and I'll explain in a moment what uh, the modified uh, total direct cost is. But the reason for that distinction is that your indirect cost will be based on that modified total direct cost. So that modified total direct cost is a really important number for you to understand because as, as you try to understand how much indirect cost will be added to your budget, you need to understand that that indirect cost will be based on your modified total direct cost, yeah? So what is then the modified total direct cost? That is all your salaries and wages, applicable fringe, and we'll talk about fringe in a moment, materials and supplies, services, travels, 
uh, part of each subaward up to $25,000. And we'll talk about what a subaward is. And um, other items are typically excluded, such as capital equipment, tuition remission, space rental, patient care cost, and so on. Yeah. Now, you wouldn't be expected, per se, to know what is included, what is not included, because hopefully, as you submit a grant um, as part of an institution, you'll have somebody in the grants administration office who would be able to help you with your budget development. However, before I submit anything to our grants administrators in our college, I want to have an idea of what I am asking for in my direct cost. If it's not grossly exceeding what my um, allowable budget will be. Yeah. So I want to get a sense, I want to get as close as possible to, to the uh, total uh, budget number as I can estimate before I send it off to them so that we don't have to do too much uh, correction. Yeah. Now, the indirect cost is also called the FNA rate. This is an amount, a percentage that is added to your grant. Yeah? And it's based on your modified total direct cost. When you submit a grant to a federal agency such as NIH, uh, each institution, each university has a federally negotiated rate. Yeah? So basically they negotiate each year for every few years, I forget actually, um, that negotiated rate. And that rate is then set for all projects, all, all sponsored research projects. So right now at Drexel, for let's say if you were to submit an NIH grant, that rate is set for on-campus activities at 56.5%. If your activities are taking place off campus, let's say you do a clinical study, off campus and all research activities are going to happen off campus, then that rate is reduced to 26%, yeah? So what does that mean? If you submit a million dollar grant in direct, in, in modified total direct cost, then you would actually be receiving a million 560,000 something from uh, NIH. That is the case in, with NIH because they add your indirect cost on top of the um, uh, modified total direct cost that you're asking for. Yeah. With some uh, federal agencies or, or other um, granting agencies, that indirect cost is inclusive, meaning if you are allowed or if the maximum allowable dollar amount for a grant is $200,000, then that indirect cost is included within that $200,000, yeah? For other agencies, such as the NIH, that is not true. Your indirect costs just get added to that maximum amount. So if it says maximum amount that you can ask for is $200,000, and you can ask for $200,000 plus indirect cost, yeah? So it's always really important for you to know is my indirect cost on top of, of the amount that I will be asking for in terms of my direct cost, or is it included in uh, inclusive of that total, um, um, sorry, maximum allowable amount that you're about to ask? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Go ahead, I have a good question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so suppose uh, there are two, uh, so there's a PI and a co-PI, and one PI is from another university and the co-PI is from another university. So both the universities' uh, indirect costs will be taken into account. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment, because if you have an investigator from another university, that investigator will be on a sub-award. And so I have on the sub-award slide, I uh, actually talk about what that means for your uh, indirect cost. But very good question. Yeah. So this rate that I list here is, is for Drexel University, and it does change. Yeah, it, it does change. Um, know that some um, um, foundations, for example, even if it's for a research project, they will set their rate much, much lower. Yeah. So many foundations have often a, a limit for indirect cost uh, of 10%. Yeah. 
some foundations do not allow indirect cost. So you need to uh, carefully check in the instructions by the uh, sponsor what indirect cost rate they allow. And then if they, let's say, the foundation only allows 10%, then you will need to let your grants administrator or your budget person know, okay, this foundation only accepts 10%. You will have to show proof of that. So for example, you know, the URL to the website or a printout of that page of the website that specifies that. And then Drexel University will, of course, accept that. If you say, well, um, the foundation does not set um, a restriction, they, you know, whatever the university, uh, or they allow 30%, and you say, but I feel bad asking for an additional 30%, so I would like us for, to ask only 5%. Then you might have a little bit of a harder time because the university, of course, want to recover as much indirect cost as possible. Yeah. However, if your grant is very, very small, it's a $10,000 grant, then whether you ask for 5% or 10% indirect cost, the university may not care quite as much, right? And if you have a good rationale as to why it has to be 5%, maybe because you truly believe it's gonna make you more competitive, then you can uh, discuss that with your grants administrator uh, or you know, our, our uh, grants administrative team in our college, and they can help guide you as to uh, what you can or should or may not uh, or should not um, ask for in terms of uh, some negotiations, yeah? It speaks for itself when that indirect cost rate is inclusive. So let's say um, you, the maximum dollar amount that you can ask for from the foundation is $100,000 for a research project. Their indirect cost is inclusive in their case, and they, let's say, allow up to, I'm just making this up, 20% of indirect cost. That would mean that $20,000 would go, about $20,000 would go to indirect costs and that you're left with about $80,000. It would be a little bit different than that, but um, that's a big chunk of money that you suddenly don't have anymore for your research, right? So if the indirect cost is inclusive, then you could should certainly speak to your uh, to the grants admin team to see okay could I could I possibly negotiate for fifteen percent or ten percent so that I have a little more money available for my uh, research yeah but that is typically a conversation something that you yourself wouldn't decide it's just a good conversation to have really early on uh, as you develop the budget so that you know that you have a good idea of what money you have to work with in terms of direct cost, yeah? Okay. Then one more important concept to understand is cost sharing or matching. Some foundations and some either some federal, some federal agencies even uh, request cost sharing or, or um, make it mandatory. For example, um, uh, several of, Several students in our department in creative arts therapies have uh, gotten money from the National Endowment for the Arts. And for many of their grants, they require a one-to-one -one match. That means that if you ask of them for $10,000, that you need to contribute $10,000. You need to be able to match $10,000. Of course, that's not $10,000 out of your own pocket. It's $10,000 that you need to be able to show that you have available to match. That could be, for example, let's say you ask $10,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts, and maybe you have also gotten a grant of $5,000 from another foundation, maybe you have secured that already, and then maybe um, you're using um, some equipment that Drexel already possesses. I'm thinking in a music therapy study, some music therapy instruments that I'm using that are already in our music therapy studio. All of those things could then add up to your match. Yeah. Um, sometimes you're, if, if it's for your dissertation research, your faculty advisor's time could constitute a match. So we have done this for one of the uh, National Endowment uh, of the Arts grants that 
uh, my percentage time that I would be advising the dissertation student was considered or was included as a match. Yeah. So uh, some in the, uh, at, in the beginning, when you, let's say you wanna ask for $20,000 or that's their max allowable amount, you may think, oh my goodness, how would I ever be able to come up with a $20,000 match? Again, talk to your advisor, meet with the grants administration of people because they might have some ideas that you didn't even think about and how you can get uh, to that amount, yeah? It is very important that that match amount is, is a true match. You can't say, oh, I'm just gonna say that I have a rich uncle who's, or, or aunt who's gonna donate $5,000 to my good cause of my dissertation and um, that money is going to make up my match. Well, it doesn't work that way. Then that rich uncle or aunt needs to give that $10,000 to the university so that the university can prove to the National Endowment for the Arts that indeed that $10,000 came in for you to spend on your dissertation. And then those expenses will need to be real. Yeah, so you can't just make up a match, yeah, it has to be uh, a real match. Okay, so then um, a couple of uh, employee or salary related concepts. What, the first one is effort, right? So whenever you put people on your grant, you need to list their effort on your grant. And that is um, sometimes in the beginning, as you develop budgets, a really hard thing, not a hard thing to understand, but a hard thing, thing to determine. How do you determine what percentage effort somebody is going to, should be put on, uh, on a grant, right? Is it 10%, 20%, 2%, 5%? 5 Part of that is going to, of course, be determined by the real effort that you expect that person to. Um, um, contribute to your grant. So let's say that person, all they're going to be asked to do is attend weekly meetings of um, two hours to just listen in and offer advice where needed uh, if some challenges occur. And then they'll be asked approximately to contribute two hours a week to um, um, maybe some supervision time of the clinicians in your, in your study. So that's four hours a week. That is about 10% of their effort, right? Four, four hours out of a 40 hour work week. So that would be 10% of effort. So for people who have very straightforward tasks like, like that, that are easily associated with a specific time frame. It's quite easy to, to figure out what their percentage effort um, will be. But for other team members, it will be much harder to determine that. So let's say you have a co-investigator who played an essential role in helping you develop um, uh, your study design, help you determine what outcomes you should measure. So really contributed a lot to the design of the project. And then they will regularly be involved or available to you um, to talk with you about issues related around study implementation or maybe around um, interpretation of the data. And they will also help with the dissemination of the results. So they will help with um, or contribute to publications. How do you, how do you put those kind of efforts into a percentage effort or into an approximate number of hours per week. It is very difficult, I find, to decide that. And so there are, um, you know, um, certain um, guidelines, that I guess, I mean, there's no, no clear set rules, but very often, if you do for the very first time as a principal investigator, you will lead a study and it's going to be a rather uh, large study then it definitely makes sense if it's your first time to put your own effort down for sometimes 30 to even 40%. However, as you become more experienced or if you have more grants, there's no way that you can put 40% effort on all of these grants or 30% effort because soon enough you will be over 100% of your allowable effort. 
right across these different brands. So that would be um, um, problematic. So of course, instead, what you do is reduce your effort and let's say you put yourself on for 20% effort or 15% effort to lead a project and you make sure you hire a good study coordinator, a full-time study coordinator who can really take care of most of the coordination and management tasks of your study. Okay, so that's for you as a PI. But then in terms of other team members, the percentage effort can also communicate to grant reviewers how important a role or how significant of a role that person is gonna play on your team. Needless to say, if somebody is included on your team for only 2% versus somebody who's included for 10%, it probably means that that person who is included for 10% is, is going to be committed more to your project, right? So you have to be um, uh, very careful in selecting the percentage effort and making sure that you can give a good justification for it, yeah? Um, however, sometimes the percentage effort that somebody is included for also depends on what you can afford. So I will, I will at times say when I'm being asked to be a co-investigator on a grant and somebody says, okay, we're going to try to include you for 5%, right? Because I have a minimal role. Maybe I just do some advisement, methodological advisement. And I say, that's fine. But, you know, if your budget doesn't allow for it, then it needs to be 4% or 3%. That's fine with me as well. I wouldn't do that if I know I'm definitely going to be spending more than 5% of my effort. But if I know that my effort is going to be on the lower side, you know, I typically negotiate with the principal investigator. And reversely, I do that with people that I invite to my team. I may say, I would like you to be involved with this aspect, but I think I'm going to only be able to afford you for 5% if I suspect that they have a high salary, for example. This is certainly true when you ask um, medical doctors, for example, to be on your um, team. So which always happens with my studies, well, their salaries are so high that they become very expensive on a team. So, and they know that. So they'll typically say, oh, just put me on for 2%. That's kind of almost like the lowest you can put somebody on, right? Um, sometimes they'll say, put me on for 2% and we'll make 3% in kind if my institution approves, yeah? And we'll talk about in kind um, a little later. So anyway, I'm giving all these examples to let you know that this is something that you talk about with the people that you invite to on, onto your team early on. It is also as a warning to be careful to not just start inviting lots of people, say, hey, I'm going to submit this grant. I think you would be, oh, you would be great on this team. And to only find when you then add up all the numbers that you can never afford even half of the people that you invite. And then it's very embarrassing to have to go, say, go back to those people and say, oops, forget about that invitation because I can't afford having you all. In addition, the funders such as NIH don't like to see a very big team, you know, especially if, there, if there's overlap of expertise or it's not very clear what people will be contributing. They don't like to see these large size teams because then so much money goes just to salaries and not to not always to um, uh, or not allowing for enough money then for you to run a powered study, for example, just because you just create a way too large of a research team. Yeah. So start small. Look what it's going to add up to. Yeah and then uh, see if you should, if maybe there's a particular area of expertise that is not yet covered, then you could uh, invite other people. But now I'm already um, moving over into budget development considerations really, but it's important to, um, uh, in the context of percentage effort. Know that for many grants, you'll have to list the percentage effort of the people, and you, will also, you may also be asked to, um, list the person's calendar months, yeah? So the two examples I gave here is for the same effort. So 20% effort equals 2.4 calendar months. And calendar months, you, you get to that amount by multiplying the percentage of a person's effort 
associated with a project times the number of months of, of the person's appointment. So for example, if you have a nine month faculty appointment or 12 month faculty appointment. I will tell you that I never do those conversions. I just, I go by percentage effort. I give that to, um, to Anitra who does uh, develops the budgets for me and then she converts that. But just so that you know that term, term calendar months what that means, yeah. Then the other thing you need to consider in terms of your um, cost of the people on your budget is not only what is their percentage effort, right? And then you have to know their salaries. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But for each person that you put on your grant, a full-time employee or a part-time employee, you need to pay benefit rate on that or fringe rate. Yeah. So fringe rate is the percentage rate that you'll have to pay of that person's salary to cover that person's benefits. Yeah, health insurance, vacation time, paid vacation time, all of those things. There's a whole long list what a benefit rate uh, or your benefit percentage uh, covers. At Drexel right now, for full-time employees, that benefit rate is at 24.4%. And for part-time employees, it's at 19.9%. For students, you don't have to pay uh, any fringe. And I know that, I don't know if Lindsay is still on the call, but she was on the call a little while ago. Uh, she is still on the call. So Lindsay, if I say anything wrong or if any of these rates are incorrect, please, uh, please let me know. Uh, or if I make any other incorrect statements about implications for budget. No, you're um, doing great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, but dude, please uh, just, just step in, okay? Or, or if you feel that something might be uh, misunderstood and needs clarification for me to step in. Hold right, on. Before you get right. your bunny, I'll, I'll let you ask in a moment. I just wanted to say that for students, you typically, you don't pay fringe. And the reason why it's so, so, so important to understand that for part-time employees, you do pay fringe, for students, you don't, is that we have happened several times, actually, with students who received awards that they in their budget had included a student. Let's say they were, they were expecting to um, hire a research assistant and they were expecting to hire a student from the master's program or, or an undergraduate student. And then they have second thoughts after they get to grant and they say, actually, I have this person who really would be great. It would be so much better to help me with this because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And I decided to do that. And so they, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, let our um, Lindsay or Matt know that they would like to hire this person for their grant. But they forget that now when you hire somebody who's not a student, you need to add fringe. And 19.9%, that's a lot. Um, certain amounts of money, especially in a very small grant. If you only have a $2,000 grant and suddenly you need to pay fringe on the salary, that is uh, problematic, yeah? So please think carefully as you develop your budget and you think about your personnel. Do I want a student or do I not want a student? If you're not sure, it's always better to uh, uh, budget for a part-time employee just so you have that fringe included. And then if you end up hiring a student, then that fringe can be used towards their salary, meaning you can hire them for a couple more hours a week, maybe. Okay. Bonnie, you had a question. Um, I was just wondering whether the fringe was, I think it is of the entire budget, right? Not of their allocated uh, um, uh, salary. It's not 25, 24% of their salary, right? It's 24% of the entire budget. It's no, it's 24.4% of that person's percentage effort on your grant. Oh, yeah, so let's say I mean. that person earns, has a salary of $100,000. They're going to be on your grant for 20%. So that's $20,000. Then you will have to pay 24.4% of that $20,000 in fringe. Yeah. So it's going to depend on that person's salary and, and their percentage effort. Yeah. So you can already see how that becomes all complicated to compute, right? All these um, extra things. Now, talking about salary, you can never ask another person for their salary. It's just not good grants etiquette. Yeah. 
So I never ask my colleagues who I invite on, what is your salary? Just so that I already can do a rough budget. It's, imp- I mean, I, I don't know, Lindsay, if, if I'm being a little too conservative here, but I find that very improper to ask. And I would find it quite strange for somebody else to ask me. Yet in the end, of course, I'm going to see it because I'm going to get the budget that needs to be approved, right? So I'm going to know that person's salary. But typically, it's going to be your grants administrative team or somebody on the team who's going to reach out to that person or within Drexel, they can look it up to see what that person's salary is going to be. If it's for somebody outside of Drexel, again, I have our grants administrators reach out to to, uh, that university or that person to know what their salaries are. I don't get involved with that. Yeah. So I just take a best guess, like, okay, that person is a full professor for 10 years already at this university where salaries are high. That person must definitely earn more, I don't know, more than $150,000 or $180,000, you know, unless I make a rough estimate for myself. But I typically don't, uh, don't ask myself. And definitely as a student, that would not be appropriate to ask. Yeah, so uh, the, the uh, grants administrative, for, uh, administrative team will help you figure that out. Okay, so then talking about personnel, um, in terms of the kind of roles that people can play on your um, uh, um, grant will also have potential uh, implications for your budget. And at the very least, you need to understand these different concepts because you will need to categorize the people on your teams according to these particular uh, categories. So first of all, you need to decide who's going to be the most important people on your research team in terms of their contributions to the scientific development or execution of your project. And uh, if that contribution is really substantive and in a measurable way, then those people are considered key personnel or also called senior personnel. So of course, you as a PI would always be considered uh, a key personnel. Very often, your co-investigators are, sorry, also key personnel because you are inviting them uh, most likely because they have or will contribute significantly to the scientific development or execution of your project. Yeah. Um, another uh, term that you will um, uh, read about is multiple PI. That is, if you and another person want to share PI role, yeah, that you're both going to be leading the projects. Multiple PIs can only um, happen if there is a good rationale as to why you need two people leading the project and what, why you yourself cannot just lead the project. Um, typically that is when the two PIs bring the complementary but quite distinct areas of expertise and you really need each of them to be leading their area of expertise within the project. You need to submit separate paperwork to offer a rationale as to why uh, you need to have a multiple PI team. So it's not something that you say, oh, I feel bad making myself the PI and asking that other person to just be the co-I. I want to make them feel important. So I'm going to also list them as a multiple PI. There needs to be a really good rationale as to why you need a multiple PI team. Then your non-key personnel is, as per the NIH definition, the people who contribute in, um, sorry, who do not, I'll have to fix that in this slide, who do not contribute in a substantive measurable way to the development or execution of the project. Clearly, I just copied and pasted a text from above and forgot to add the word not, but it is do not contribute. However, I find that actually a bit of a a, um, troublesome definition because, for example, research assistants and study coordinators are are not viewed as key personnel. Yet I'll tell you the study coordinators on on my studies are extremely important to the execution of of my projects. And they really contribute in substantive measurable ways to the success of my projects. But really what I mean here is that these are people 
who do not contribute in a substantive, measurable way to the scientific development and execution of the project. So it's you do not per se need that particular person in order for you to be able to implement the study in a scientifically rigorous way, yeah? So a study coordinator, I may have a really good study coordinator, but I could certainly hire another study coordinator. Or if my current study coordinator would leave, it's not like I suddenly have a big gap in my research team in terms of scientific knowledge. I would easily be able to hire another study coordinator. Yes, do you understand the difference? Another um, type of, or another category of personnel are consultants. Consultants are typically considered non-key, but they can be included as key personnel, just so you know. But a consultant is different from your other personnel is in that they offer a, a service for fee. So you don't include consultants uh, on a percentage effort or on a percentage of their salary. Instead, they will have a very specific task that they'll be consulting on, and you will predetermine how many hours a year or how many hours a month, and you compute it over a year, they will be contributing to the project. Yeah. So your consultant might say, might help you just with um, a very specific part of the analysis of the data where you feel that their expertise would be invaluable in helping you understand the data. And that consultant may say, mm, I probably wouldn't need more than 10 hours to, to help you with that. Then that consultant might only be listed in your final year of your grant for 10 hours at a rate of whatever their consultant rate is. Yes, yeah, some consultants ask for $100 per hour, others $200 or even $300 per hour. Yeah, but you don't pay fringe on consultants' rates. Yeah, so their rate is going to be typically more expensive, but you wouldn't um, pay a fringe on that. Yeah. For your um, key personnel, um, I forgot to say that their percentage effort can also vary. Typically the key personnel is available for the duration of the project and will be involved for the duration of the project. But for example, when I add a statistician to my team, I typically um, have them for a higher percentage in year one and in the year that I may need to develop um, a midterm report and then in the final year. And then the in-between years, I might drop their percentage effort because they won't have to actually run analyses for me. Yeah, so sometimes your percentage effort might vary a little. And then uh, a final type of personnel is uh, considered under contracted service. It's not really um, um, listed under personnel per se, but it is somebody doing work for you, such as maybe a statistical service. So maybe you don't need a statistician on the duration uh, on your project for the duration of your project because have a small project with maybe simple statistics and you just need them at the very end um, to run some statistics for you. And so you could, or it may be cheaper for you to just ask them how much would it cost for you to analyze this data? And they might say $5,000 and you just enter that in your final year as a contracted service. Or many of you who do qualitative research may want to include a transcription service. That's another example of a contracted service. Yeah. Any questions about types of personnel? Nope, we're good to go. All right. Okay, couple more things. Um, equipment versus supplies. You will see when you um, get the uh, when you submit a grant um, through Drexel and you submit your budget or a rough budget to. Um, the grants administration uh, team in our college, that they will develop a budget for you using an Excel spreadsheet. And you will see that equipment and supplies are different item lines. So it's important that you understand what the difference is. Also, your funder, such as NIH, makes a clear difference between the two. So equipment is defined as 
uh, at least as per NIH, as an item of property that has an acquisition cost of $5,000 or more and an expected service life of more than a year. Yeah, so if you buy something that costs more than $5,000 and it's supposed to last more than a year, that would be considered a piece of equipment. Yeah. Equipment that is less than $5,000 is typically included under supplies. And that is because equipment of more than $5,000 that has a life expectancy of more than a year is excluded from indirect calcul cost calculations. Yeah, so it has implications for the indirect cost. So an example of an equipment of less than $5,000 might be a wearable biomarker measurement tool, for example or in my case, music instruments, or maybe, um, mm, yeah, uh, uh, art supplies um, uh, for um, the art, uh, for Bani on the call today, okay? Equipment that is more than $5,000, but with less than one year service life could also be included, uh, should also be included under supplies, yeah? Laptops and uh, computers, uh, can also be included under supplies. They typically don't cost more than $5,000, at least not your uh, straightforward computer or laptop. However, please know that you need to be able to make a good justification for including computers and laptops in most cases. So you should only include it in the, in the direct cost if that laptop is primarily or exclusively used in the actual conduct of the proposed scientific research study. So I will typically include a laptop for my study coordinator because they will need it to do all the tasks that they need to do for the study. However, I cannot say that I'm gonna include, at least I don't think so, Lindsay as for NIH guidelines, I. I cannot say I'm going to include another laptop for myself because I think my laptop is on its last legs. And rather than having uh, Drexel pay for uh, a new laptop for me, I'm just going to include it for myself. However, if I would need, let's say I'm a PC user, I need a Mac laptop because I need particular music software such as GarageBand specifically for this project that I'm asking funding for. I could uh, make a justification as to why I need to uh, buy a, lab, uh, a Mac, not a lab. All right, so that is just in terms of equipment uh, versus supplies. Now on to sub awards and Bonnie's questions. So sub awards are uh, needed whenever you need to pay another institution or organization for carrying out intellectually significant activities as part of your research project. So for example, um, you're gonna use a clinical site where the clinical interventions activities for the study are going to take place. They're typically are going to want you to pay for that, pay for people to help you recruit there, consent people, or if you even if you use their uh, interveners, um, their therapist or whatever, you will need to, of course, pay them for the percentage effort that these employees will spend on your research project activities. Or it could be that you are um, uh, collaborating with an organization who will develop an app specific to your research project. Yeah? If it's specific to your research project, you would need a, a sub-award, okay? Um, I see a question here. Do you use subscriptions in supplies? I'll let you um, ask that question in a moment, Bonnie. I just wanna make sure uh, I understand what you mean. If you have a co-investigator at an other university or organization, who will be uh, listed on your grant as a co-investigator, that would need a sub-award because again, that pers person's percentage effort will need to be included uh, in your budget. So sub-award budgets may include items such as salaries, supplies, and materials that will be needed uh, by that organization to do the work for you, uh, maybe travel uh, by their employees to, to your site for meetings or um, travel to conferences where they, some of their employees may help you present or disseminate the findings. And you need to know that that sub-award budget will include indirect cost calculation and fringe, but that those will be based on their institution's rates, yeah? So our 
uh, indirect cost rate or um, yeah, indirect cost or federal indirect cost right now is at 56.5%. For some um, universities that may be higher, maybe 60% or it may be lower, it may be 48%. Yeah, same for fringe. So these rates are not the same across universities. Again, you would not need to compute that, but it is important that you, you begin to set up subawards through the Drexel Grant Administration team as soon as possible, because that's the only way that you'll get an accurate number of what that particular subaward is going to cost you in your budget. You don't want to wait too long to get that ball rolling because you may then end up being severely over budget if you have two or three sub awards and you didn't expect these, you know, their salaries to be so high, maybe their indirect costs to, so, to be so high, and now you're looking at trying to cut uh, the budget. I will also tell you, try to limit the number of sub awards as much as possible. They're very time consuming. Uh, and they're very nerve wracking because you can imagine our teams at Drexel are extremely busy, but the research teams at other universities are extremely busy as well. So it's not like you request a sub award and within two days you have all the information you need. It often takes weeks back and forth for the sub award to be finalized. So it can be uh, quite nerve wracking and, uh, and then a lot to deal with afterwards as well in terms of just paperwork to get the sub award set up. So Bonnie, you had a question about supplies I saw, go ahead. Uh, yeah, but also this one, sorry, if you could share again why, uh, what is the rationale for the sub award? Like if somebody is already listed as a co-PI, a co-I, and uh, their salaries have been, you know, kind of fixed or whatever, why do we need, do, does the co-I always have to have a sub award only if they are at a different institution than your own. So if you I submit see. a grant through Drexel and they're, let's say, at Jefferson University, you need a sub award because Jefferson, that person is not an employee at Drexel, so Drexel has no I way see. of paying that. So instead, Drexel will pay Jefferson for Jefferson to pay that person, you know, or to have that percentage effort covered. Uh, you know, uh, under their their uh, Jefferson's uh, positions or salary. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And my other question was for the previous slide: do do we also use subscriptions in supplies? Like again, like you mentioned, but for example, it may be a qualitative analysis software that hypothetically, if the university doesn't use or offer. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what you mean with subscription. So if you mean software, then yes, uh, you would definitely include that. Like I use MaxQDA, Drexel does not have a MaxQDA license, uh, yet if I need my study coordinator to do analyses using MaxQDA, I would have to include that, that subscription um, a cost so that I can get it downloaded on her uh, computer. So yeah, the same for any other software. Yeah. Thank you. And Yoka, I actually have a mm -hmm. quick question about supplies versus equipment for larger supplies, um, say like assay tests where one assay could cost or one test could cost about five hundred dollars. And if you're doing five of them or ten of them, that's five thousand dollars right then. Does that become equipment or is that still no. supplies because it's a single use? It's still supplies um, because it's, uh, and Lindsay, please co um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'll try to explain it and you let me know if it's correct or not. Because I had this for my current NIH uh, study, Benjamin, um, overall with all the essays and, and supplies that we needed to, to run, it was over $30,000. Yet that was not included. Like I didn't have to give a, a separate rationale as to why I had equipment of more than $5,000. It just added, the cost of all together added up then more than $5,000. Is that correct, uh, Lindsay? I actually, I don't want to speak to it because I would say that to some extent it might vary a little, but I would say that I would go with what Yotha is explaining right now because I think that that would more than likely be the response across the board, especially with that being the NIH that's often used as just a standard. Yeah, it's uh, typically the cost of a single piece of equipment. Yeah. 
And by the way, if you include a piece of equipment of more than $5,000 on your grant, you need to give a special explanation, a special explanation of that is needed. So you can't say, mm, I think I'm going to include an fMRI machine on my uh, grant because I, you know, I think uh, we need one. Well, at Drexel, since we don't have one yet, you might have a really good rationale there. But if you're at a university where there's plenty MRIs and fMRI machines available, you're going to have a hard time getting, getting approval to buy yet another fMRI. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. Um, and then another question kind of with supplies is um, if you're doing over $5,000, do you need itemized supplies versus like a generic supplies list of say chemicals and supplies? It, it, is there a differentiation between yeah. or number so, limit that? Yeah, so typically um, it's very interesting because I was actually looking that up last night and it says if it's less, if the supplies, I believe it was less than a thousand dollars, you don't have to itemize them. But I have had reviewers ask like, hmm, why is no? So I always, itemize them. I may not include, for example, if I'm going to include music instruments and I'm going to include um, an iPod that I need and I'm going, I may just say music instruments, you know, $800, iPod, so many dollars. But when I submit it to uh, Anitra for my budget uh, computations, I do give her itemize everything what I need so that they can double check that my numbers add up and um, yeah, so then I do. But uh, what your funder uh, request will will differ, you know, for sure. I recently submitted a grant actually to the NEA and they didn't even need a justification for the supplies. It was just, we just had to enter the number uh, for it. And I, uh, I did say what I was gonna buy, but not this is gonna cost so much or this is gonna cost so much. Yeah, so that will depend funder, on, you know, depending on your funder. So good, good to read your um, grants guidelines. All right, I think that we are at the end of the slide. So any other questions that you have? Or any other concepts that you've heard that, um, you want to ask about? If not, no problem. Go ahead. Oh, I thought I, I saw. I was just, it's just me. Uh, if, if we don't have any questions, uh, then thank you so much, Dr. Brock, for a wonderful presentation. And thanks everybody for joining us here today. You're very welcome. Have a good evening, everyone.